morning. How are you? It's great to see so many of you here. Thank you so much for coming. And a very special thank you to all of my colleagues here who brought their here today. So we cannot run this project without faculty participating. And so thank you so much. Uh, many of you in the audience, as I'm looking around, uh, probably were just mere glimmers in your parents' eyes yes, way back in this time frame. So uh, for many of you, the Vietnam War was truly history, something that's passed. But um, even though I'm not a historian, I'm an English teacher, I still like to promote the idea of history because we are history, every single one of us here. Everything that's ever happened in the world has led to this moment. So you are part of history, and this is something that we all need to know about because as we know, there's wars going on now. And if we forget what happened in the past, that means we have to keep really again and again. So um, just something to think about, especially with the last little snippet of song that just played. Okay, so as some of you may know, the One Book Project is in its third year of operation. Uh, can't I'll be reading this book, Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carry, which is a collection of stories about the Vietnam War. Uh, each year, the committee brings to campus various lectures and events to bring the selected book to life, to draw around it a circle of context, to remind readers, all of us, to remind all of us, that words and books are not meant to lie flat in the covers of these pages, but they are alive, and they relate to every one of us in our daily lives. Uh, this morning, on behalf of the One Book Committee, I would like to welcome Professor Maureen So. Uh, when the committee was planning events last summer, Professor Sowa's name came up from many sources as the person we should ask who could put O'Brien's novel into historical context. And a little history about the historian. Uh, besides her 25-year career here at BCC, Professor Sowa served in the U.S. Navy for almost six years. She was the first woman in naval intelligence since World War II. She is an historian by training with specialties in American history, Native American studies, and modern East Asia. When she's not preparing for her classes, you might find Professor Sower relishing her memories of being a rally car fan, or perhaps working in her garden, or planning her very long drive to BCC from her home in New Hampshire. Now that's dedication. <laughs> but wherever you find her, it is guaranteed that Professor Maureen Sower will have something very interesting to say, and quite a lot of it, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So everyone, uh, please welcome Professor Maureen Um, I don't usually use a microphone because I can generally be heard in the next county. Uh, comes from all those years. Uh, I joke pushing boots. Uh, anyway, thank you all for coming. And what I'm going to try to do today is to put the Vietnam War in some kind of historical context for you uh, so that you will um, be able to understand the stories in O'Brien's The Things They Carried a little bit more fully. I used to quote up here from Richard Nixon. Uh, it feels like I was sort of looking at the uh, misinterpreted uh, statement by Bush, but this is directly from Richard Nixon. He contended that the Vietnam War was the most misunderstood of America's conflicts. And to some degree, he is correct. A lot of the mythology ha has done tremendous harm to Vietnam veterans and Vietnam era veterans. It's important to understand that. So I promise I'll try not to bore you with all the historical details. Um, basically, I'm going to give you in about 60 minutes what generally takes me three class periods to talk about in 14. So I'm compressing it a great deal. Um, the other thing is, and, and I laughed when Denise said that, my, my former dean used to say that he could drop a pencil and it would take me 45 minutes to describe its fall. So be prepared. Um, this is America's longest war. It runs literally from 1945 to 1975. Now, the, the hot part of the war is really 1965 to 1973, 
but there were, to use the current phrase that drives me over the falls, boots on the ground, very, very early. So I'm using a new one of these, so let's see if I can get it. This is a map of Vietnam. Uh, it will give you a sense, if you look at it, how Vietnam is shaped like an S in total territory about the size of New England. So I want you to think how it must have felt. Now, the entire Vietnam about the size of New England, cut it in half, and then put 568,000 foreign troops in the southern half. And think about how that must have disrupted uh, traditional society and culture. I mean, that's pretty profound when you look at it that way. Um, major areas, and I tried the pointer here, and let's see if I can get it to do what I want. Whoops. Nope. Okay. Um, this way, that's the historic capital of Vietnam, back when they weren't foreign occupied. This area down here, the Mekong Delta area, probably the richest rice area in all of Asia. Prior to the Vietnam War, Vietnam was a net exporter of rice. In other words, they fed Asia. After the Vietnam War, they had to import food in. Just right about here. It's not marked on this, because this is a current map. It's the 17th parallel. That divided Vietnam in half temporarily. OK, keep that in mind. Um, right up here, Da Nang. That is a major area of American presence. That's where we brought our amphibious troops in initially. Down here in what was Saigon was the major port of entry for troops as we rotated them in and out. 365 days from the time your feet touched the tarmac at Tonsonut Airport to the time that the plane lifted off. And all you had to do was stay alive for 365 days. What's interesting is the government learned a lot from this. They learned that putting troops in and this type of a rotation destroys unit cohesion. You can see that in O'Brien's book. The new guy, you put the new guy out front because you're not hooked into him yet. If he gets killed, it doesn't mean anything. You put the guy with a short timer's chain. By the way, the short timer's chain used to be made of pop can tops from beer. Uh, the, the pop top came off, and you linked it in a chain, and you wore it on your helmet or on your, uh, I'm trying to think of the proper term. I was about to use a not very nice slang term. But you put it up there on your hat, your cover, as it said. Um, anyway, so. A little background, uh, just so you get a sense of the Vietnamese, because we spend so much time on the American side of this equation, we forget there's another side, and that's the Vietnamese. The last time Vietnam was fully independent was 111 BCE. The Chinese invaded. And if, we, if you look back at this map, you can see how it shares an enormous border with China. <coughs> the one thing the Vietnamese had was they had rice. The Chinese had a huge population. Consequently, they forced the Vietnamese to be a tributary state of the Chinese Empire during the dynastic period. Okay, uh, What that means is they got to keep their own king, and their own aristocracy, but they paid tribute to the Chinese in the form of a rice levy, like a rice tax. Uh, what does this mean to what we're talking about? 
well, for the next 2,000 years. The Vietnamese will fight off foreign invaders. Uh, they will not yield easily. As a matter of fact, the Vietnamese had um, their own Joan of Arc, only they were twin sisters, the trans sisters, who fought against the Chinese and almost won. The Vietnamese had a, a nickname uh, by the turn of the 20th century. They were called the Prussians of Asia. They did not deal well with foreign invaders, and we should have paid attention because they worked really hard to throw them out. The French moved in in 1954. It took the French until, pardon me, 1954, 1854. It took them until 1867 to actually consider Vietnam conquered. But in reality, it is not until 1895 that Vietnam was fully suppressed. The Japanese conquer Southeast Asia, Vietnam in particular, in 1940. So what, do you sh what should you take away from this? that the Vietnamese have fought their conquerors throughout their history. They have fought foreign invaders. The Vietnamese, under Ho Chi Minh, um, that's not his real name, by the way. Uh, he was called occasionally Li Doc. Uh, the freedom fighter. Ho Chi Minh was a name he took to highlight his uh, quest for Vietnamese independence. There's a whole bunch of background here that I could give you to say we had a chance in 1918 at Versailles to, to help the Vietnamese, but Woodrow Wilson didn't want to. Anyway, the Vietnamese declare their independence from the balcony of a hotel on a square, a French hotel, by the way, it had been, at a square in the northern city of Hanoi. You know how they declared their independence? They read a version of the American Declaration of Independence. They substituted French references for English. I think that's pretty profound right there. Um, the French did not want to lose control of Vietnam. Why? <laughs> because they, um, I'm being recorded, so I'm keeping the language clean. Uh, they had lost the Germans pretty handily, and their egos were a little squashed and the possession of colonial empire was one of the hallmarks of a major power. They were also afraid that if Vietnam could just go on its merry way as independent, then Algeria, more important to the French, might do the same thing. So they were determined to stop the independence. They engineered a coup d'etat uh, in uh, September, September 23rd, 1945, where they placed in control of all of Vietnam the hereditary emperor of Vietnam, uh, a fellow by the name of Bao Dai. Now you should say to yourself, where was he? Why wasn't he there? Well, he had spent World War II on the French Riviera, ch chasing um, French wine, French song, and French women. Uh, the uh, French forced him back into Vietnam to be the figurehead for French control. So you have the French-supported Vietnamese government under Bao Dai. It is accidental that the seat of power is in the South, because that's where the French were strongest. Why? 
That's where the Michelin rubber plantations were. Uh, Vietnamese had a saying that Michelin rubber was so strong because the trees were watered with the blood of Vietnamese peasants. Um, so the French powers in the south. Ho Chi Minh, it's accidental that his power is in the north, but that's how it shook out. So, phase one of American involvement. The French seek American help in 1945. Our initial assistance is covert, secret. We give money. And occasional former OSS advisors to help them get organized. You know how we got the money to them? I love this little piece of trivia. We funneled it through the Marshall Plan. So the next time you hear about how wonderful the Marshall Plan is, understand that it was also used as the uh, camel's nose in the tent in Vietnam. Initially, so 1945 to June of 1950, it's just money and a little secret advisors. What happens is the Korean War. That changes the equation. American leaders see the action in Korea and by extension in Vietnam as the advance of communism around the world. And God knows we've got to stop those commies. So we actually put American boots on the ground, publicly on the ground in 1951. 250 Air Force mechanics whose purpose it was to keep the Vietnamese Army Air Force in the air. Uh, but they're Americans, and a target is pretty much on their back. There are some injuries early on, no deaths yet. The end of phase one comes when the French are defeated miserably in Dien Bien Phu. Dien Bien Phu was a Mountain Valley in the northwest of northern Vietnam. The French had this wonderful idea that if they, they were annoyed that the Vietnamese wouldn't stand still and fight. <clears throat> you know, how dare they? So they thought that if they could draw the Vietnamese into what's known as in military circles a set peace battle, then they could just wipe the floor with the Vietnamese. Uh, General Henri Navarre, the commanding artillery general, uh, his colonel suggested that they put five units of French legionnaires, about 25,000 men, in the valley of Dien Bien Phu to suck the Vietnamese in. Uh, because then we could pound them from the air, we will beat them on the ground, they are just Vietnamese. Well, you put troops in the valley, folks, what do you have to worry about? Who said high ground? Thank you, sir, high ground. And the French said, well, it's a lot of high ground. The Vietnamese will never get artillery up there. It's too high, it's too hard, it's a jungle. So the Vietnamese took their artillery apart, hauled them up the mountainside, hollowed out the side of the mountain, covered them, put them back together, and March of 1954 began to shoot French fish in a barrel. Uh, by the time May rolled around, by the way, they had stuck them in caves so the French vaunted Air Force could not nail them. Um, whoever has, that's a nice little uh, sound. Mine is Reveille, by the way. When it goes off in the bedroom, my husband bolts straight up and he says, one of these days that's going to get you killed. <laughs> but it does wake me up. Old habits die hard. Anyway. 
um, only 10,000 left alive, 5,000 seriously wounded. By the time they are walked out of Dien Bien Phu to Hanoi, there's only a little over 5,000 alive. The French say, that's it, we're out of here. And they call a Geneva Convention, uh, where signed in July of 1954 is the Geneva Accord on Southeast Asia. Got a lot of stuff in it, but the essence of it is a temporary division of Vietnam. Notice the term, temporary. Temporary division of Vietnam at the 17th parallel for, you want me to bring it down? Oh, you're moving something. I saw a hand and I thought you were saying I was too loud, which is not unusual. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, at the 17th parallel, splits it just about in half. A two year cooling off period after two years, then there would be a nationwide election to reunite the country. What is interesting is that the US government and the government of Bao Dai did not sign the agreement. We reserved the right to do what we wanted. And what we did immediately was begin to attempt to move as many pro-Western Vietnamese to the southern part of Vietnam. Now, what do I mean by that? Largely, we tried to move anybody who was a Vietnamese of Catholic faith to the south. Uh, the estimates are about a million Vietnamese refugees were moved south because the thought was that in those days that if you were Catholic, you were by definition anti-communist. Bless you. Okay. So, what do we do? 1954 to 1956. 1956, supposed to have a nationwide election, right? Wrong. What we decide to do is to prop up a government in South Vietnam and prop up the mythology that it's a separate country. What's interesting when you look at Vietnam and why I thought it was so important to put the things they carried in historical concept, context is that a lot of it is mythology on both sides. The, South Vietnam was not an independent nation. It was supposed to be rejoined with the North. But the U.S. worked actively against that and created the legal mythology that South Vietnam was an independent nation by unilaterally including them in the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. And then the government in South Vietnam could say, help, help, Americans, we're under attack. And we could put troops in there. Initially, American military presence is 750 advisors, senior enlisted men, and field grade officers, generally majors, who were supposed to train the South Vietnamese Army, the ARVIN, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. More importantly, I think, is American aid between 1956 and 1961 <clears throat> was about a billion dollars. Now you're all sitting there going, well, that's freaking chump change now. But in 1960, a billion dollars was serious coin. So clearly, what were we doing? We were pouring our prestige, our treasure, and a small group of men. But there's an old Bedouin proverb about letting the camel's nose in the tent. When you let the camel's nose in the tent, it's only a matter of time before the entire camel is at dinner. These 750 advisors were the camel's nose in the tent. 
Phase two. Phase two goes a long time, 1961 to 1975. Um, John F. Kennedy articulated in one of his speeches that we will go anywhere, bear any burden, pay any price to fight the spread of communism. What this translated to was something called the counterinsurgency doctrine. Basically, it means you identify a revolution and then you take steps to stop that revolution. So it comes out the way you want it to. America, beginning with Kennedy's administration, had a series of failures in the developing world. Um, Cuba, the Bay of Pigs, Africa, in, in Angola and the Congo, uh, not to mention the fact that Kennedy and, and Nikita Khrushchev, uh, Khrushchev saw Kennedy in his memoirs as being weak, ineffective. And so it became clear to the Kennedy administration that they had got, they had better get tough and get tough somewhere where they could have success. I've been digging around the Kennedy archives for quite a while, and I actually located a document that referred to Vietnam as the laboratory for counterinsurgency. Think about what that means. First of all, it doesn't give the Vietnamese people any historical agency. It says that they're a place where we're going to experiment to see how this works out. Unfortunately, we experimented with American lives, let alone the Vietnamese lives. So what was Kennedy's strategy? Uh, strategic Hamlets, number one. Uh, that's referenced in the book. This actually, <laughs> believe it or not, originated in America's war in the Philippines in 1901. Uh, strategic hamlets is a fancy word for saying define concentration camps. Let's push everybody into villages, define that village as secured or strategic, and if you are outside of that village after dark or before dusk, you are in a free fire zone, and your ass, frankly, is grass. Um, it did not acknowledge any of the, of the elements of traditional Vietnamese culture, uh, cultivation of their rice paddies, which often were a good distance from these strategic hamlets. Um, second strategy was to use special forces troops, um, the Green Beret. The Green Beret were uh, created, elevated is probably a better word, because they already existed. But they were made uh, public by Kennedy as his special force. Uh, generally, there were 10 men in a unit. They were cross-trained in both warfare and what was called pacification. In other words, medical, um, community affairs, things like that. The thinking being that if we could win their hearts and minds, then we could win this war. Uh, one person said, if we win their hearts and minds, their asses will follow. And last but not least was the use of U.S. helicopters. Helicopters had just entered into military use during the Korean War, and they were largely medevac. Uh, but with advances in aeronautics and other aspects of helicopters, uh, the thinking was that helicopters could be used as light infantry insertion, that you could put 
ground pounders into a place, have them fight a war, pull them back out by helicopter and take them back for a hot, hot shower, hot meal. Can you think of the emotional dislocation for troops to be in the jungle fighting a war one minute, be pulled out by helicopter the next, given a bud, a steak, a hot shower, and then told maybe in a couple of days you're going back out. It was a real problem. The South Vietnamese government, which we supported, was becoming increasingly repressive. South Vietnam was about 85% Buddhist, and a, a, a type of Buddhism that was distinctive to the Southeast Asian area. Uh, and the Buddhist, uh, the Buddhist temples were more than just places of worship. They were gathering places, schools, things like this. And Buddhist monks began to organize resistance to the South Vietnamese government. Uh, one elderly Buddhist bonds was motored up to an intersection in April of 1963, lit himself on fire as a protest. Well, that was bad enough, except that the South Vietnamese government leadership suggested that what the country really needed was a few more Buddhist barbecues. Hard to argue you're supporting democracy in a country where they're okay if their people are burning themselves to death in protest. As a result, No Din Ziem and his brother were assassinated November 2nd, 1963. What would Kennedy have done? We don't know. Because Kennedy's dead three weeks later. Pro-Kennedy um, historians argue he was on the cusp of pulling troops out. I'm actually not so sure. Maybe after he was reelected in November 1964, he would have, but I'm not so sure because he doesn't change his advisors. That's, that's my one argument. But anyway, Johnson becomes president of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and what he always calls to his biographer, Doris Kearns Goodwin, he, he calls the Vietnam conflict that bitch of a war. In a quote to her, he said, I left the woman I really love, the great society, for that bitch of a war, and I lost everything. Johnson was determined to expand JFK's commitment. Why? First of all, he had felt oppressed by the Kennedy boys, and he was determined to show himself that he was more macho than the Kennedys could ever be. So part of it is going on up there. He increases direct American activity. U.S. naval forces support the operations of the South Vietnamese Navy north of the 17th parallel. This brings about an attack called the Gulf of Tonkin attack, where two U.S. naval destroyers may well have been attacked by North Vietnamese PT boats. We don't know. According to the lieutenant commander flying the lead jet in, Lieutenant Commander John S. McCain. He said the night was darker than the hubs of hell. And he didn't know. That was in his debriefing. As a result of these attacks, Johnson gets the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which orders him or authorizes him to take all necessary measures in Vietnam. It's a blank check, folks. Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, William J. Fulbright, said it was a little like grandma's nightdress. It covered everything. <laughs> now, so I think more important for us 
in this context is who bore the burden, who fought the war. 9.7%, so almost 10% of the generation who came to age during the Vietnam conflict, during the height of it, from 1964 to 1975, fought in Vietnam. That means they were uh, in country, or they were on ships that were on market station, or they were assigned to airfields in Thailand or in other parts of Southeast Asia and flu support. So about 10%. What it, I, I thought what we'd do is go through the myths a little bit. One of the myths is the majority of Vietnamese uh, American Vietnam soldiers were drafted. It's not true. 66% were volunteers. Now, I had somebody, by the way, these stats all come out of a Defense Department report. I had somebody mention, well, 66%, but how many volunteered because they knew their draft notice was coming? Uh, I married one of those. He got his greetings letter, and rather than serve in green in the jungle, he wanted some place he knew would have a hot shower periodically. So he joined the Navy. Perhaps some because of the draft. But remember, folks, the draft where it was based solely on deferment, that meant I'm looking around here at some of you young men. As long as you kept your grades up each semester to 2.0, you received, received a 2S deferment. That meant each semester, gentlemen, if you had a bad semester, tough noogies. You were reported to your, log, uh, your local draft board. Nixon changes that in 1969. Early 1969, Nixon went to a lottery <coughs> system where your birth date was given a number. What's interesting is the anti-war protest actually fell off because all of a sudden people knew if their number was high, chances are they weren't going. So, of these volunteers, 70% of those killed in action were actually defined as volunteers. So while the draft feels bad to think about it, it's not the reality. The other myth was that a disproportionate uh, number of American blacks were killed in the Vietnam War. This is not correct. It probably is more likely if the Defense Department shook out their stats by socioeconomic status. It might be more interesting because this is a working man's war. But in reality, 86% who died were Caucasian. 12.5% were black. 1.2% were other races. What's interesting is the 12.5% African American is exactly the percentage that they were in the population at this time. So it's not disproportionate. Why do we feel it is? Why has this myth taken hold? Um, I respectfully suggest it's Hollywood. Um, when Hollywood does history, it occasionally feeds the myth. The myth was that the war was fought by the poor and uneducated. Um, the reality was that 79% had a high school education or better. 
Now, the Defense Department says this was the best educated armed forces of the United States ever sent into combat, and they are probably correct. The average educational uh, level of troops during World War II was sixth grade, uh, because that's when you could leave school. Was it sixth grade? Uh, why do they have a high school education or better? Uh, bless you. The U.S. military decided it wanted men and women with a high school education or better unless they had exceptional skills. So I think that stat might be skewed just a tiny bit. I'd have been more interested in where they were from. Were they from blue collar working class families? with a high school education or, or what. Um, another myth is that PTSD is more severe among Vietnam vets. Not true. <laughs> Reality is the condition has been called different names in different wars, but it's always existed. It probably is more severe in the first five years they return. But after that, PTSD does not rise up and destroy them. Um, the myth, the crazed, drug-using Vietnam vet, you know, the one you see in the Hollywood movies all the time, the reality is less than 0.5% of Vietnam veterans are in prison. And a VA study indicated there's no difference in drug use between Vietnam era veterans and non Vietnam era veterans. They also did another part of the study that looked at veterans as a whole with the civilian population, and there's no real difference. The myth is the average age of the American soldier because of the draft was 22 years old. Uh, pardon me, was 19. The reality is he was 22. Now, that probably is because um, the uh, need for officers skewed the numbers. Why do they need officers? Yeah. Well, initially, their advisors, their... But during this period, okay, during this period, why do we need officers? They fly the freaking planes. Uh, that was probably the aspect of American involvement in Vietnam that gets lost. A lot of those KIAs are lost when their airplanes go down. Not as much in the jungle. World War II average, by the way, was 26 years of age. It's a young force, but they're not teenagers. There's also a myth that the suicide of a uh, Vietnam veteran population is 6 to 11 times greater than the non-Vietnam veterans population. A CDC study suggested it's much more complex than simple statistics. During the first five years, it is higher. It's probably about 1.7 times more likely that a Vietnam veteran is going to commit suicide after returning. After that period, it is no more likely than non-Vietnam veterans. So, why go through all this? Because when you read Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carry, some of that mythology is in it, in part because of how we remember our involvement. I go back to that original comment about the Vietnam War is the most misremembered <laughs> of all of our conflicts. I'm also struck, I'm a historian standing up here talking about a war that occurred in my generation. 
If the truth be known, good history cannot be written until at least four generations have passed. The very best history of the American Civil War was not written until the 1960s. So how, how dare I make an analysis? I can present you the facts, and hopefully you will think about what they mean. And you will ask the questions the next time somebody makes one of these statements that are clearly not supported by statistics. Well, told you I could talk forever. Uh, finish up the combat portion, and then you can ask me whatever you want. Uh, Lyndon Johnson's strategy was pretty straightforward. He was going to put as many boots on the ground as he, as he could. In uh, March of 1965, uh, Marine Corps uh, Amphibious Division landed at Da Nang the first time since the Korean War. Uh, and it very quickly accelerated to 568,000 um, men in country. He also authorized Operation Rolling Thunder in February 1965. Um, I always, somebody said to me, why call it Rolling Thunder? I said, well, if you've ever heard of B-52 go down a runway, sounds like Rolling Thunder. Operation Rolling Thunder was the saturation bombing of North and South Vietnam as much as possible, but North Vietnam. Now, we tended to bomb the same targets over and over again because nobody wanted to drop bombs on Hanoi and Haiphong because the Soviets were there. And nobody wanted to upset the Soviets at this point. Johnson also increased the use of pacification. This was the carrot and stick approach to winning the war. The stick was search and destroy. Um, bye, no problem. Search and destroy meant you went into villages, you look for VC and NVA, and even if you didn't find them, you burned the village because you denied them sanctuary. The carrot part was to offer to rebuild it after you'd burned it. The Tet Offensive forced a decision on Lyndon Johnson January 31st, 1968, after telling the American people that the light was at the end of the tunnel. He forgot to mention that light was the train that was about to run him over. The Tet Offensive was a full-fledged North Vietnamese Army attack on Southern points. They lost. We won. But as a Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese colonel said in Paris when an American said, we never lost a battle. And he said, what difference does that make? In other words, we had sold the American people that we were winning and we clearly were not. Uh, the My Lai Massacre on the 16th of March, 1968, convinced Johnson that there was no way out. So he announced the American the American people on March 31st, 1968, that he would not seek nor would he accept his party's nomination for the presidency, and that he would spend the rest of his time in office seeking a peaceful conclusion to Vietnam. Talks opened in Paris on May 13th, 1968, and they immediately deadlocked over the shape of the table. They eventually decided on what looked like a donut, where there was no head or foot or side. It was just a big round circle, and everybody took notes in the center. 
LBJ ordered a bombing halt on 31st of October, 1968. Oh my Lord, almost, what, 45 years ago, give or take, 40, 43. Um, he ordered a complete bombing halt. A projection indicates that had the halt been earlier, Hubert Humphrey may have won the election and defeated Nixon, but Nixon won. Tricky Dick won. He had campaigned on a secret plan to end the war, and when people asked him what was that secret plan, he said, it's a secret. His secret plan was pretty simple. Part of it was secret. It was the secret bombing of Cambodia. Uh, the military called this, uh, it was called Operation Menu, uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snack, depending on the size of the bombing run. A year before, we actually invaded the Parrot Beak. Um, he also authorized Vietnamization, which was a callous estimate that the American people would not oppose the war if we didn't have men on the ground. So what we began to do was shift the war over to the Vietnamese and pull American troops out. Um, and last but not least, he put pressure on the Soviets to put pressure on the North Vietnamese to come to the peace table. Euphemistic, I'm a diplomatic historian by training. This is called triangular diplomacy because you can't put pressure yourself, so you have somebody. The North Vietnamese were dependent on the Soviets for equipment. So get the Soviets to do it. The North Vietnamese backed out of the peace talks. Nixon operated on a principle called the madman theory of war. Convince the other guy you're just crazy enough to push the button. Hanoi and Haiphong had been safe from American bombings until the Christmas bombings. Nixon ordered a saturation bombing. The North Vietnamese came back to the table and signed the Armistice Agreement. On January 23rd, 1973, the war continued for another two years as we draw, drew down American troops, uh, what I often think is just really the, the height of historical irony. This was largely a non-conventional war, right? Largely guerrilla, except for our bombing and our use of that kind of technology. March 1930, uh, March, Mar March 1930, March 30th, 1975, the, um, the units of the North Vietnamese Army regulars started to move south in what was a standard operating military mechanized movement. Tanks, APCs, the whole nine yards and moving south across the 17th parallel, refugees running in front of them blocked the road. So Arvin troops could not get up the roads to meet them. The North Vietnamese Army entered Saigon and Saigon fell April 30th, 1975 in what amounts to a classic World War II operation. I always think that's the, the height of, of irony. And that, she said, is that. Does anybody, are you tired? All that stuff, there is a ton more. Does anybody have any questions or? Yes. A point on the 19-year-olds. I heard 19-year-olds was the mold age. Well, there were more 19-year-olds than any other age 
You mean that was, uh, but if you looked at the average, that function, yeah. Yeah. that took the older and the younger. Youngest people to die in Vietnam, there were three 16-year-olds who put their age up. And there was one 62-year-old who died. The 16-year-olds put their age up. In other words, they faked documents because they wanted to join. You cannot even join at 16, even with a parent's signature. So they had to have lied. Back then, you need to have your parents. Yeah, you, uh, for 17, yeah. you needed a You still do, actually. Um, but that's a good point. Uh, I think it's important, though, that we look at the average. Yeah. What was the average age of the pilots? Right? Average age of the pilots were 24. That gave them um, training time, which was minimal, <laughs> uh, which was interesting. Yeah. Uh, some were older still. What was the youngest? Oh, what a great question, and I've got to be honest, I don't know. The man who holds the youngest record for a Navy pilot is still George Herbert Walker Bush. He was 19 when he was a World War II pilot. So, I, I mean, I always think, so it had to be older than that. You had to have, in the Navy, you had to have a college degree, a bachelor's. Now, the Army was not as strict for helicopter pilots. You could uh, become a helicopter pilot without a college degree. And when did that end? When did, what would you say that, like the classification now, I know there's a lot different than then, but when did it end so that that little uh, loophole could, uh, like today, I think mean, you need more than that. Yeah. You know, um, I think under the DOTMA, Defense Officer Personnel Management Act of 1992 established a number of criteria that you had to fulfill in order to come in the service. It also changed the retirement benefit plan. It changed educational plans. It did a whole bunch of stuff. It also allowed women to stay on active duty pregnant. Dotma did, which I think was a step forward, but that's just me. If you spend $50,000 to clear me, you should not have thrown my ass out. But um, anyway, any other questions? I just think it's really interesting. Yes, sir. Um, the Vietnamese written alphabet seems to be the Roman alphabet highly accented. Cambodian, uh, I, I, I see an alphabet of their own, and of course Chinese. So is it just that Vietnam only got a written alphabet at the time no, the Europeans no. were getting there? I think what happened with the Vietnamese written alphabet is that it's a, a function of transliteration. Okay, yeah, the French imposed uh, a simplification on the Vietnamese for their alphabet. Their alphabet is similar to the Chinese in that it was in the beginning pictographic. In other words, it's, um, English is, is a language based on syllables, okay, and sound. Uh, uh, many Asian alphabets are based upon tonal inflection, and the symbol is a pictographic symbol. It symbolizes something. And there are things called uh, free radicals that alter the picture. I mean, I don't have anything to write on up here, unfortunately. But it, it's a great question. And what's happened over time is that the Asian languages have been uh, simplified because of the need to do business in the global marketplace. Yes? So, uh, Maureen, you spent a lot of time talking about these amazingly complex factors. Yes. That were Yes. Afghanistan. Yet, um, in our media or in our government, um, all of these things are hidden behind these little slogans. Um, 
freedom is not free. You're either with us or you're with the terrorists. Things that, all these complex things that are, that are uh, pushed down into these tiny slogans. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about why that happens and, and what it does to a okay. culture that and goes to war or does not, does either supports or does not support? Woodrow Wilson, when he took this country to World War I, said, leading a democracy to war is something that we really need to think seriously about because to get a democracy to agree to war, you have to demonize the other guy. And then once you've done that, it's like letting uh, the genie out of the bottle. Anybody having connections to those groups are then suspect. Uh, why do I think it gets bottled in slogans and phrases? You folks need to understand, and I did not do as much as I should have done on this, but the anti-war movement was largely coming out of college campuses. And it was coming out of college campuses because it was their ass on the line. They were afraid of the draft. Once the draft shifted to a lottery system, the anti-war movement diffused. You need to understand that the number one song on the billboards was the Green Beret by Sadler. Now, people aren't going to buy that song unless they support what it says, right? So there was a sense that if my government says we're over there to defeat communism, better we fight it over there than at the Golden Gate. That's part of what we see going on now is no one wants another 9-11. So you can sell going to war by arguing that if we do it over there, we won't have to do it here. My problem is that I don't think the cost, the burden is shared sufficiently. But that's just me. Um, there's a whole field in military specialty now uh, called public affairs officers that are trained in how to package information properly. Don't you think that embedding journalists in the Iraq war was one of the smartest things the, the Defense Department ever did? Because then you connect those journalists to the men that they go into combat with. They are not going to report anything that is going to question. all over the world. And so everything that we were getting ready to do, every plane that we had, every strategy that we were doing, was being programmed and was being sent all over the world, including to Vietnam itself. So our our own strategy, I mean our own plan, our own secret mission, were not really secret. Well, I would argue that there were a lot of secret missions that never made the nightly news. I'm thinking of Operation Daniel Boone in Cambodia and some other things, okay? Um, the problem was, I think, with the nightly newscast is that it desensitizes you, um, the American people, to what's going on. And, and when you see continual violence, then you are desensitized to the idea of, of the fact that war is ugly. War causes horrible wounds. And, and I must tell you, folks, I, um, I volunteer at a local veterans hospital up at White River Junction, Vermont. And um, I, I crochet. You know, it's kind of geeky, but I do. Uh, and I donate Afghans. Uh, and, and the wounds that you see with these young men and women is horrific and they are surviving the battlefield because our medical advances on the battlefield are so good now I don't know the answer but I did just deliver an Afghan to a young man with half his head missing half of uh, his brain hemisphere was gone he survived 
and uh, they're thinking they're going to be able to rebuild his skull. I was talking to his mother. Um, but think about that. And I, I also, and, and I don't know if you guys watch it, but you know, the Wounded Warriors Project and, and stuff like this where they're asking for donations. It really makes me angry because our government ought to be there. These guys shouldn't have to go begging for help, getting a job, getting physical therapy, depending on the kindness of strangers to help them. The government sent them over there. It, they should be helped. But that's me on my soapbox, so please forgive me. Uh, punching an old veteran. Yes, sir, Mr. Peter. Yes. Yes. He said when we when we lost Walter, when Walter Cronkite turned against the war, Johnson said when we have lost Walter Cronkite, we have lost the American people. Right. Two very different questions. Yes. Yes. Are there any films for them, and I've seen many of them, worth watching? That's the first question. Oh. <laughs> uh, I got a couple of favorites. Yeah, well, that's what I'm um, I love Go Tell the Spartans. It's not widely viewed, but it looks at Vietnam before Da Nang, when it really is largely an agency war with Green Beret and, and others and how we got trapped in there. I love a film called Gardens of Stone. That's a, a military reference to a military cemetery. They are gardens of stone. And it's a remarkable film that, that sort of, it's not war. For God's sake, don't watch um, Apocalypse Now. Okay, that's Francis Ford Coppola's LSD-driven vision of what Vietnam should be. Um, the other one, the... Platoon? No, Platoon's, uh, Platoon's uh, Stone. Pla a Full Metal Jacket, thank you. We Are Soldiers Once and Young. I would recommend the book first, okay? Um, the movie is really quite remarkable. Um, and it is worth uh, a look at it because it's right at the point where it gets ugly. The first cab has been set in, sent into the Idrang Valley, and it's the first combat operation of helicopters. What's the name again? Uh, we were soldiers. Um, the book is called We Were Soldiers Once and Young which is a reference to an old phrase, you know. Um, a Full Metal Jacket is horrific. Mm -hmm. uh, it again is, is Hollywood's drug-induced haze of what Vietnam should be. Uh, Green Berets, John Wayne and the Green Berets. John Wayne paid, he produced that movie because he couldn't get anybody else to do it and he wanted this movie out there. It is terrible, <laughs> but it is a piece of sort of historical document to show that it was just about two years too late because it was so awful by that point, it comes out after the Tet Offensive and everybody's going, oh, give me a break when they, they go to see it. So anyway, yeah, Peter, another question? Yes. Uh, CIA uh, no smoking gun, but certainly some pretty inferential telegrams that authorized them to do something about Siam and his brother No Din Nu. Uh, they clearly green lighted the coup. Did they green light the assassination? Um, my instincts are, 
yes, but that's just my instincts. There are no, there's no smoking gun. You know, no, uh, make sure you kill him, <laughs> sort of uh, communique. They needed to get rid of him. Yes, sir. A movie I haven't seen for 30 years, Hearts and Minds. Oh, that's a documentary. It's a remarkable documentary, a little heavy-handed. It won the 1969 Documentary Academy Award. A uh, little heavy-handed with regards to the football analogy. But as you watch that documentary, you will notice that some of the scenes in the documentary that are real appear in Platoon like using a, a Zippo lighter to light fire to the, the straw hooch roof, appears in the documentary as actual uh, film. Well worth the, the look. Thank you all so much, and, and I appreciate it. <laughs>